We are ending our Eats with Sinners uh, series of sermons this morning. But I just want you to understand that just because the series is ending, hopefully our desire to reach out and eat with sinners, our desire to learn the lessons that Jesus has taught us through this, this sermon series has not ended. I hope that has not ended, even though today is the last sermon. I don't know about you, but this entire series has been challenging to me. It made me think about how I live my life, how I react, how I see people. It it made me look at how important my attitudes are. And it kind of gave me this way of evaluating my evangelistic efforts. And to be quite honest, as I went through this series, I often fell short in my own evaluation. I'll admit it. Maybe you did too. The proper response, however, is not to shrug off the series and say to myself, well, I fell short I might as well give up. The proper response is not to forget about what you've learned and what God is challenging you through His his, uh, Word. The proper response is not to beat yourself up with guilt and think to yourself, I'm a failure. There's nothing good in me. The proper response is to work to do better. That's the response that God wants. That's the response we all need to have. Heard a story about a Christian barber who owned a barber shop, and one night he was at a revival meeting, and and, and he felt this great burden to be more more evangelistic, to to testify more about Jesus, to share his faith. And so the next evening he uh, he attended a, a, a center a soul winners class, a soul winners class. He attended that soul winners class every evening for two weeks straight. At the end of the two weeks, they gave him a, a plaque and, and told him that he had you know, finished the course and finished it well. And so he started rehearsing the material that he'd learned. He, he looked over the notes that he had taken. He memorized the assigned Bible verses. After the completion of the course, the next morning at the barbershop, he hung his plaque on the wall. And before he opened the doors, he bowed his head and he said this. He said, Dear Lord, Help me witness to the first man to come through the door this morning. At that very moment, he unlocked the door and in walked the biggest, meanest, foulest man the barber had ever seen. It seems this man had lost a bet with some of his biker buddies and now he had to shave his head and he was not happy about it. Needless to say, the barber didn't feel real excited about sharing his faith to this man with a huge tattoo on his neck. So the rest of the day, he didn't do any better. He he didn't share his faith with anyone. He didn't share his faith with that man. He didn't share his faith with anyone who came in the door. And by 5 o'clock, as it was about to be closing time, he was sobbing in shame. He bowed his head once again and he said this. He prayed this. Lord, if you allow me one more opportunity, I promise I will do my part. And at that very moment, the door opened and in walked a pleasant looking gentleman. The man smiled at the barber. He apologized for coming in so late and he took a seat in the chair. The barber draped the cloth over the man, the protective sheet over him and He remembered what he was supposed to say, and he was going over it, trying to figure out what he was supposed to say, and he began to get a little bit confused as he's preparing to share his testimony with this man in the chair in front of him. He kind of stalled, and he started to lather the man up with some shaving cream on his face and try to remember the answers he was supposed to give if there were any objections, and he began to stroke his razor to get it ready to shave the man's face, and he, he just couldn't remember what he was supposed to say. And he started to get very nervous, and beads of sweat came up on his forehead, and he began to breathe heavily, and he didn't know what to do. Finally, in desperation, he shook the razor at the man, and he screamed, Are you prepared to die? <laughs> <laughs> uh, are you prepared to die? Be quite honest, that's a very appropriate question for all of us. Are you prepared if today you went to meet your Lord? Truth is, you may have forgotten a lot of things through this series. 
You may have forgotten things that we've discussed. You may have thought, forgotten the things that, that the Word of God challenged us with. But hopefully you still desperately want to share the good news. So what do you do? What's the solution? If you've forgotten, what are you supposed to do? Well, Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 through 30, this is one of my favorite verses. This is what Jesus says. He says, come to me, all of you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. But listen to how you get your rest with Jesus. He says, take my yoke upon you. Let me teach you, because I am humble and gentle at heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy to bear, and the burden I give you is light. We often hear these verses, and we're excited. We're like, yes. I need some rest. I'm looking forward to some rest. But Jesus says, wait a minute. You find rest, but you find that rest in being yoked to me. You find that rest in an instrument of work. And essentially, Jesus says, if you want to find rest for your souls, then hitch your life to me. Hitch up to me. Walk where I walk. Do what I do. Go where I go. And that is really what I want you to remember as we end this series. Really, the truth is we need to just do what Jesus did. We need to walk where Jesus would walk. We need to learn how to look at the world around us with the eyes that Jesus had when he looked out at the world around him. Now, maybe you have heard of this concept. It's called situational awareness or operational awareness. They're both uh, synonyms here Situational awareness, this is the definition of those things. It's perception of elements and environment within time and space, the comprehension of their meaning, and the projection of their status in the near future. Now, that is a big, wordy definition, but the truth is it simply means this, to know what is going on around you. Operational awareness or situational awareness is to know what is going on around you. Now, for this last sermon, I want to challenge you and me to try to hone our opportunity awareness, to see the opportunities that are around us. There are always opportunities to witness for the Lord just right within our reach if we will open our eyes to them and act upon them. Nearly every day there will be an opportunity for you and for me to Share Jesus in some way or share his love or serve someone. There are all these opportunities around us each and every day. In Matthew 28, verse 19, you know the, the Great Commission, but here's what Jesus says. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and Son and Holy Spirit. And he goes on. He goes on to say, and teaching them to obey everything I commanded you. And surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. That's what he says. But here's what I want you to focus on, this word go. Now, so often we think that this word go is kind of this call to a foreign mission field, call to, to go somewhere else. But the truth is, really, it's about while you are going through life, make disciples. While you are at work or at school, make disciples. When you head to the gym or the grocery store, make disciples. Wherever you go, make disciples. Jesus' command is not to head off to some foreign land necessarily. Now, there's nothing wrong with that. But his command is actually be a missionary right now, right wherever you are, with whomever you come into contact with, as often as you possibly can. Be a missionary now, today, where you live. So today I want us to look at opportunity awareness. And I want to start off with what I would consider probably one of the easiest opportunities. This, this is surely something we could grab hold of. If this opportunity came into our life, surely we could jump on it. It's found in Mark chapter 10, verses 47 through 52. When Bartimaeus heard that Jesus of Nazareth was nearby, he began to shout, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Be quiet, many of the people yelled at him. But he only shouted louder, son of David, have mercy on me. When Jesus heard him, he stopped and said, tell him to come here. So they called the blind man. Cheer up, they said. Come on, he's calling you. Bartimaeus 
threw aside his coat, jumped up, and came to Jesus. What do you want me to do for you? Jesus asked. My rabbi, the blind man, said, I want to see. And Jesus said to him, Go, for your faith has healed you. Instantly the man could see, and he followed Jesus down the road. Now the first opportunity I want us to be aware of is we need to be aware of those who are calling out for Jesus. We need to be aware of those who are calling out to us. Now, this would seem pretty straightforward, wouldn't it? Surely, if someone yells out to you, hey, I need to find Jesus, you could respond to that, right? Surely, if someone calls out to you and says, hey, I need someone to show me how to be saved, you could, you could respond to that. I mean, it seems pretty straightforward. Bartimaeus heard that Jesus was coming. He wanted some healing, and so he yells out to Jesus, hey, Jesus, help me out here. And by the way, Jesus does help him out here. If someone calls out for salvation, surely we can provide, right? Sometimes I wonder if we don't fall into the category of the crowd instead of the category of Jesus. I think I'm making a noise here. Sometimes I wonder if we don't fall into the crowd instead of the, the category of the crowd instead of the category of Jesus. Remember what the crowd did. Bartimaeus is, is calling out and they said, hey, be quiet. Hey, be quiet. Hey, don't bother Jesus. Be quiet. Hey, I want to know about Jesus. Hey, hang on a minute. Be quiet. We're getting ready to start services. Come on. Hey, I want to know about Jesus. Whoa, wait a minute. I need to catch up with friends. I can't talk to you right now. Someone over there I need to talk to. Hey, show me Jesus. Hey, we're on the way to the restaurant. And if we don't hurry up, the Baptists are going to beat us. We're in a hurry. We're in a hurry here. Hey, show me Jesus. I'm on my way to work. Hey, show me Jesus. I got to get home and watch a television program. Hey, show me Jesus. I got other things going on in my life. I, I can't stop and talk to you right now. It's so easy for us to put people off and lose the opportunity to share about Jesus. It's so easy for us to ignore a request. Now, sometimes we don't always recognize them as a request, but they are requests. They are requests. Maybe someone is calling out to Jesus when they tell you about how lonely they are. Maybe someone is calling out to Jesus when they say about how fearful they are. Maybe they're calling out to Jesus when they tell you about a struggle they're having in the midst of a relationship or a health issue that's going on. Those are calls for help. I need help. And we know the one who can help them. We know the one who can help them. Throughout this sermon series, we have often quoted this verse. I want to quote it out of the message today. It's 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15. Through thick and thin, keep your hearts at attention in adoration before Christ your master. Be ready to speak up and tell anyone who asks why you're living the way you are and always with the utmost courtesy. Peter tells us, be ready to give an answer when people call out. When people call out. Paul Harvey once said, too many Christians are no longer fishers of men, but are keepers of the aquarium. Have we become so unaware of the fact that when people are calling out with issues in life, with struggles, with concerns, that they're actually calling out for help? Help, and we know the one who can help them. Are we so unaware that we miss those opportunities? We need to have opportunity awareness. Now, the second one I want to look at is found in Luke chapter 19. You are familiar with it, verses 1 through 10. Let me read it to you. Jesus entered Jericho and made his way through the town. There was a man there named Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector in the region and was, had become very wealthy. He tried to get a look at Jesus, but he was too short to see over the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree beside the road. For Jesus was going to pass that way. When Jesus came by, he looked up at Zacchaeus and he called him by name Zacchaeus. He said, quickly come down. I must be a guest in your house today. Zacchaeus quickly climbed down and took Jesus to his house in great excitement and joy. But the people were displeased. He has gone to be the guest of a, 
of a notorious sinner, they grumbled. Meanwhile, Zacchaeus stood before the Lord and said, I will give half of my wealth to the poor, Lord. And if I have cheated people on their taxes, I will give them back four times as much. Jesus responded, salvation has come to this home today. For this man has shown himself to be a true son of Abraham. For the Son of God came to seek and to save those who are lost. We go from an easy one, people calling out, to one that's a little bit harder to be aware of, and that is we need to be aware of those who are showing interest. We need to be aware of those that are showing interest. Now, why did Zacchaeus climb the tree? Well, he wanted to see Jesus. He wanted to see Jesus. Now, we don't really know why he wanted to see Jesus. We're not told why he wanted to see Jesus. We're just told he wanted to see Jesus. That may have been the end of it. I just want to see what Jesus looks like. He, he may have been looking for Jesus because he wanted to figure out what all the hubbub was, a, hubbub was about. Um, that's it. Maybe, maybe he's just curious what Jesus looked like. I don't know. It, we're not told. Maybe it's like a parade. You know what I'm saying? A parade goes by and everybody's scrambling to be able to see what's going on in the parade. And poor little Zacchaeus is a short little feller. And he didn't know how to get to the front of the line, so he had to climb a tree so he could see what was going on in the parade. But one way or the other, he wants to see Jesus. But I want you to understand, Zacchaeus is not our example here. Jesus is our example here. Jesus is the example. Because as Jesus is walking down the street and he comes to this tree and he sees this feller up in the tree looking down at him, trying to get a glimpse of him, what does he do? He sees Zacchaeus. And he invites himself over. Now, once again, Jesus is our example here. So if you think that there's someone interested in Jesus, maybe it's time for you to invite yourself over to their house. Hey, I want to come over to your house and have dinner. <laughs> Just tell them, you know, come on, Jesus did it. Jesus did it. I'm coming over. Oh, well, maybe you can invite him over to your house. Either way, it doesn't matter. But invite yourself in. That's what Jesus does. He invites himself over. And then after some time with Zacchaeus, Zacchaeus is convicted and he publicly declares, he publicly declares, I am going to give back what I've stolen. I'm going to make amends. I repent. And Jesus says, this man is worthy. This man's been restored. He wants the whole crowd to know that this guy is in the right place now. Let me ask you a question. Are you looking for those who are interested to share Jesus with? Maybe, maybe they just show the, the least little bit of interest. Maybe they ask you a question like, hey, why are you so happy in the midst of all this uncertainty? Now, there is a precursor to that. You kind of have to be happy in the midst of all uncertainty. I mean, if you're grumbling in the midst of all uncertainty and you're complaining about everything in the midst of the uncertainty and you're, you're angry about all the uncertainty, then they're probably not going to ask you. But So if you are happy, carefree in the midst of it, maybe, maybe, maybe there's a little bit of interest there. Hey, why do you go to church every Sunday and every Wednesday and small groups on Sunday night? Why do you, why do, you do all those things? That, that's an interest that's being displayed right there. Why do you treat that guy over there with respect when he doesn't deserve it at all? Why, why are you treating him with respect? He, he doesn't deserve that. I want you to understand that oftentimes people are showing interest when they ask questions like that. You, you know, what's your church like? That, that's, that's a show of interest. It's an opportunity for you to share your testimony. It's an opportunity for you to share what Jesus has done for you. And it's an opportunity, at the very least, to invite them to come and see. Why don't you come on out and see what our, what our worship service is like. Ephesians chapter 5, verses 15 through 17 says, So be careful how you live. Don't live like fools, but like those who are wise. Make the most of every opportunity in these evil days. Don't act thoughtlessly, but understand what, God, what the Lord God wants you to do. Or in other words, keep your eye out for every opportunity. 
Keep your eye out for every opportunity. By the way, when they're grumbling about what Zac- about Zacchaeus and Jesus is talking about this man, he has been re- he is he is faithful. He is restored. He is forgiven. Then he says, "The Son of Man came to seek and to save that which was lost." You know what? That's us. We're we're supposed to be seekers and savers. When I was a kid, we used to play hide and seek. Anybody ever play hide and seek? I always loved being the hider. I hated to be the seeker. I didn't like being the seeker unless you actually got to tackle someone or something like that. That was fun, you know, if you could do that. There's something about hiding that we like. We like to, to be the one that someone's looking for. To be quite honest, that's the world around us. They like to be the someone, someone that someone is looking for. It, it says there's a worth. You have worth to me. I'm looking for you. I'm searching for you. I'm seeking you out. Are you aware of those who have interest? Show a little bit of interest. Jesus was. Jesus was. The third one is, are you aware? Oh, the third one, let me read the text first. John chapter 4. Eventually he came, talking about Jesus, to, Samar- uh, to the Samaritan village of Sychar near the field of, that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired from the long walk, sat wearily beside the well about noontime. Soon a Samaritan woman came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Please give me a drink. Now, here's the last thing I want us to look at this morning, and that is, are we aware of those who aren't aware? Are we aware of those who aren't aware? Are we aware of those people who aren't even aware that they themselves are lost? They don't know they need Jesus. They're not even looking for Jesus yet. But are we still aware of them and aware of the opportunity we might have? Because here we find Jesus, and this is a completely different different situation. Bartimaeus is calling out to him. That's one thing. Zacchaeus is showing some interest. That's another thing. But here we come to a woman who... As far as we can see, shows no interest and makes no uh, effort to speak to Jesus. In fact, here we find Jesus essentially making an opportunity happen. He just makes an opportunity happen. He says, you know what? I need to strike up a conversation. Hey, I'm thirsty. Do you mind getting me something to drink? Now, here's the key. When you and I have opportunity awareness we realize that we might just have to broach the topic of Jesus on our own. We might just have to step up and share that that Jesus is here for them. Share that even if they don't understand their loss, that Jesus has something to offer them. As I was preparing, I found this story. Don Wilton, who's an author, a preacher, and a teacher, he shares a story. He had the opportunity to serve on Billy Graham's team for a crusade in Korea. He was sitting on the platform one night during the invitation right next to Billy Graham. Dr. Wilton couldn't help but notice that during the invitation, Billy Graham started looking down at his fingernails. He he was studying his fingernails. And Dr. Wilton thought to himself, what is going on? I cannot believe that Dr. Graham is so unconcerned about this invitation that he is studying his nails. In fact, the more that Don Wilton thought about it, the more he got upset about it. He started having this growing animosity inside. You know what I'm talking about? You see something going on, and it's just making you mad. And so he's sitting there, and he's getting angrier, and he's getting angrier, and he's getting angrier. And then Billy Graham turned to him and pointed to the Korean woman who had walked up, or at least one of them who had walked up. He said, do you see that lady who just came forward to talk to the counselors? Yeah, yeah, I see her. Billy Graham said, well, she did my nails today, and I was able to share with her about Jesus. I was there to share with her about Jesus. That's the spirit and the habit you and I need to get into. We need to be looking for opportunities to tell people about Jesus. You and I, we need to to let people know that we know something they need to know even if they don't know they need to know it. In Acts chapter 18, verse 9, this is what it says. It says, one night the Lord spoke to Paul in a vision and told him, don't be afraid, speak out, don't be silent. I think that's 
something we need to take to heart. Don't be afraid. Speak out and don't be silent. Keep on sharing the good news. Keep on telling people. Keep giving people the opportunity to accept Jesus. Remember this woman who wasn't even looking for anything. Do you know what happened with her? Later in the chapter, verses 28 and 29, it says this, The woman left her water jar beside the well and ran back to the village, telling everyone, Come and see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could he possibly be the Savior? So he's grabbed hold of her heart. She's going back telling the, the whole town about what has gone on. And then just a few verses later, verse 39, many Samaritans from the village believed in Jesus because the woman had said, He told me everything I ever did. All from an opportunity that Jesus just made happen. Brothers and sisters, the opportunities are all around us. Every single day, there's all around us. Some people are shouting out, help me. Show me Jesus. I need something. They're shouting out. Some people are just seeking. They're showing some interest. They're, they're giving us little glimpses that they, they might be ready to kind of look a little deeper spiritually. But others don't even realize how lost they are. But in every single category, you and I are supposed to be seeking and saving them. Seeking and saving the lost. Elton Trueblood, the Quaker scholar, once compared evangelism to fire. Evangelism occurs, he said, when Christians are so ignited by their contact with Christ that they in turn set other fires. It is easy to determine when someone is aflame. It ignites other material. Any fire that does not spread will eventually go out. A church without evangelism is a contradiction in terms, just as a fire that does not burn is a contradiction. My prayer is that through all these weeks of studying, each with sinners, our hearts, our lives have been put aflame. We have got this fire inside us that makes us desire to share the good news with other people. And our fire can turn into a blaze if we continue to share it with those around us. Do you have an evangelistic fire in your soul, in your gut? Romans 12, verse 11, Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. You and I, let's keep our spiritual fervor serving the Lord. Let's get excited about seeking and saving lost souls. Let's be aware of the opportunities that are around us each and every day. We pray with me. Heavenly Father, we come this morning and I recognize as we close this series, so many things just spoke to me. They, they convicted me. In fact, they challenged me. And Lord, I hope that each one here has been challenged as well. And Lord, I, I pray that our vision has been transformed, that we are in fact those people who are looking for opportunities, those people who are uh, aware of those that are around us and, and are aware that we are supposed to be seeking them out. Some of them may be shouting, some of them may show interest, and some of them may not know at all that they even know that they even need Jesus, but all of them are our mission field, and all of them should be on our radar. So Lord, I pray for each of us that we will keep our eyes open and that we will step into every opportunity that is given to us and that we will even create opportunities when at all possible. Thank you for Jesus' example. And I pray that we have yoked ourselves to his life and will follow in his footsteps. I pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen.